if you've had an opportunity like me to visit congregations around the nation, even around the city, you'll, you'll quickly begin to realize that what a blessing it is that we can all go to the New Testament as congregations no matter where we are, look to the pattern that's found within God's word, and we can all have unity. No matter where we're at, no matter what part of the world we're in, no matter what our background is, we can go to the New Testament. We can pattern ourselves as the church after that example that we see in the first century, and we can all practice the same things. We can all believe the same things. We can all follow after Christ in the same exact way as people all, all across the world. And what a great blessing that is. And it's because we pattern ourselves after the church of the New Testament that that's possible. When we start interjecting our own ideas, when we start changing the, the, the authority that we have in God's word about how we do what we do, what we believe, what we believe, quickly we find out that, that we won't have unity and there's discord and there's disagreement and there's strife. Sometimes I wonder, because I'm like this, I guess, and, and if you know me, you know that this is how I am. Uh, sometimes I wonder, what would it be like if we could transport ourselves magically back to the first century and we could sit down with congregations uh, that, that existed back then and worship with them? What would it look like? Would it look similar to what we're doing here today? Would there be things that are, are so different that, that we just maybe not even recognize it? Kind of conversely, what would it be like if we were able to transport Paul or Peter or James into our assembly this morning, would they recognize what it was that we were doing? And I pine away sometimes because I feel like over the past 2,000 years, we have fought a lot of battles, spiritually speaking. We have fought a lot of battles, a lot of very strong and, and, and hotly debated topics in the church over the last 2,000 years. But what would it have been like to be back in the church of the first century and be able to say, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, and not have to add like 17 asterisks beside that, not have to put like a giant caveat to say, well, here's what I really mean. But you know what, today we we've, we've have to do that. We feel like we do at least. Well, it's, it's hard for us simply to say that we're filled with the Holy Spirit, period, end of story. It's hard for us today, I think, to say, that we're saved by grace, period, end of story. It's hard for us just to stop there because of the battles that have been fought over obedience, over the things that, that we need to do in our lives with, sal with regard to salvation. Of course, that guy just decides not to work on me. Good thing I'm up here. Sorry, everybody in the back. So we, we have had over the last 2,000 years to really have to, to change the way we talk about our faith. And I wonder if, if we haven't fought so many battles that what we're doing today isn't influenced by some of these things that we've had to fight in denominationalism. And I wondered about this and I thought, you know, wouldn't it be nice just to go back to the first century and not have to deal with any of these things? And then I ran across Revelation chapter two verses one through seven. Open up your Bibles with me, please. Let's look at Revelation chapter two, verses one through seven. This is Jesus speaking to the church at Ephesus. And by the way, what an ama amazing section of scripture, right? For God, his son, to speak directly to the churches of the first century. He was able to talk directly to them and say some very pointed things. What, what would he say to us, I wonder? I, I'd love to know. Uh, I'd love to know what Jesus would say to us specifically. But here he speaks to the church in Ephesus, chapter two, verse one. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. This is Jesus. I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear with those who are evil, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored in my name's sake and have not become weary. Stop right there. 
they were good at fighting against false teaching. And he's actually going to say something more after he rebukes them about the good that they do in fighting against false teaching. You have fought battles, and you are strong in those battles. You do not put up with anyone who claims to be an apostle and is not. And, and he's going to talk about some other things. They're good at battling. And they've done a, they do, they've done a wonderful job at that. Verse 4. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works, or do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Here's what I believe that they had done. I believe they let the pendulum of their faith go so strong onto the other side of fighting battles that they forgot why they were even fighting in the first place. They forgot love. They forgot about the core fundamental truth that they should have been following. So it wasn't enough for them just to fight and, and, to, and to stand against false teaching. Verse 6, but this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And so I say this, over the last 2,000 years, the church has fought a lot of battles. There have been a lot of battles like the deeds of the Nicolaitans. There have been a lot of battles like false apostles. And we maybe have spent so much time fighting those battles, has it impacted us in the way that it impacted the church at Ephesus? Have we forgotten love? Have we forgotten the most important things about our faith? So what I want to do this morning is talk about five battles very quickly that we've faced. And if you're new to the church and are not familiar with these battles, I'm not going to talk about them in great detail. But if you're new to the church and have not experienced conversations about these things, we'd be happy to study with you after this lesson. Uh, it's something that if you've been in the church for any length of time, you know every single one of these battles very well. And I want to talk about the danger that those battles present to us as Christians and how we can find balance in our own lives in dealing with these things. There's more than five. There's way more than five. But we're going to talk about five this morning. So let's start. Baptism is not necessary. It's a battle that we've fought quite a lot in our, in our faith. We have, we have fought tooth and nail against those who would say that the waters of baptism are completely unnecessary for our salvation. The denominational world has decided that that particular act really is less important or even not, not important at all in bringing us to salvation and washing us away from our sins. And it's beyond me to how, how many passages they would have to ignore, people would have to ignore, to be able to miss the point that baptism is necessary for our salvation. But here's the danger for us. So we fight against this. So we fight so hard against this doctrine. And I believe we should. Don't get me wrong. At the output of this lesson, I want you to understand that every single one of these battles that we have fought over the years, I believe they are important. And I believe they must be fought. But there is a, there is a, a condition that happens to somebody when they spend their entire life on the battlefield and never know how to get off of it, never know how to leave it. And maybe in the church we've, we've established that sort of idea, is never understanding, never being able to walk away from that battle to what is most important. And so here's the danger. The devil wants us to highlight one aspect of salvation more than the other. And so we spend so much time talking about baptism and so much time focusing on it that maybe we miss the rest of God's requirements for us. Is, is baptism so important that it would do what it needs to do for us if we don't confess, if we don't repent, if we don't actually have faith to begin with? Is baptism effective without those other steps? And so, yes, it's important that we, that we talk about baptism and the importance of baptism, but let us not forget that godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. It's godly sorrow that produces repentance, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. It's godly sorrow that leads us to repentance. And we read verses like this, and don't feel like you have to add an asterisk there and say, oh, and don't forget about baptism, too. Godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation. In Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, Paul would say, if you confess with your mouth, uh, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. He never talks about baptism there. 
And he doesn't need to. Because the point of what he's saying there is you need to believe in your heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that will lead you to salvation. And so let's make sure, rather than overemphasizing points of disagreement that we have about God's word, that we remain balanced in our handling of the gospel, in our handling of truth. Focusing just on one aspect is, is not productive because God never focused on one aspect. It's the whole package. And so let's make sure that we're not the kind of people who only want to scratch the surface of God's word and deal with just one topic and have a hobby horse topic. Let's make sure that we, we focus on the whole thing, especially when trying to teach somebody what to do to be saved. It's everything. It's repentance. It's confession based on a true and abiding faith. And it's the baptism that washes us free from our sins, the whole package. So we fought the, ba the battle of baptism, right? We have also fought the battle of instrumental music. For many, many years, we have fought the battle of instrumental music to the point where many people would, would view us as the Church of Christ as, oh, you're the ones who don't believe in instruments. That's, that's the way we've been labeled anymore, and that's the way we are perceived. But obviously this battle is important because we have authority from God's word in the New Testament about what we should be doing in our worship, the songs that we offer, and we have no authority for instruments and, and those kinds of things. The world doesn't necessarily care uh, about sticking to that authority and, that we have in, in God's word. So we fought this battle for a very long time. But the devil wants us to focus on what we should not be doing, to take our, our focus away on what we should be doing. You ever heard that term defined by what you're not? You ever heard that, that described? I could stand up here for an hour and a half and tell you what we don't do, right? I could do that. I could, I could explain to you for at length the, the various things that we don't do in our, in our Christian service, in our worship, but would that ever lead you to know what we should do or what we should believe? Maybe, maybe we have spent so much time focusing on the way we should not worship and taken our focus away on Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 through 21, which tells us to be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, making melody in our hearts, giving thanks. Songs, as, we've, as we had our, our uh, song meeting a while back with Scott Wyatt, it was hard to walk away from that and not understand the great power of music, right? It was hard to walk away from that and really miss the point that music and songs is something that God knew would touch our hearts to the point where it would affect us and change us and mold us into the kind of people that he wanted us to be. How awesome God is for, for giving us that avenue to worship him. But when you go to read passages like this, is your first comment in a Bible class, and there we are, and this is the reason why we don't use instruments. Rather than saying, let's focus more in depth about singing and about the way it touches us and about the way it, it impacts our life and the importance of what God has given us rather than the lack of importance of what God didn't give us, if that makes sense. So the balance we need to strike is focusing on what passages do mean and what the great things about God's instruction for our worship that he has given us and what a great and beautiful plan that God has given us to follow and to worship him according to. Okay, so we've fought battles on baptism. We've fought battles on instrumental music for years and years. We have also fought, especially in more recent years, about battles of diversity and tolerance. There are plenty of places across this, uh, across this nation that have no problem accepting within their midst those who are of various uh, sexual orientations, those who fit within the alphabet soup of 
lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, whatever the, the soup du jour is that day. There are plenty of places that don't have any problem with, with those kinds of folks coming in, being a part of their group, and they'll condone that behavior all day long. And it's a, it's a touchy subject for me because I hear, I have heard it from time to time, people deride the phrase, come as you are. But let me be clear. If you're here this morning and you're visiting us for the first time, I don't care where you came from. I don't care what sins you've been struggling with. I'm glad you're here. And I'm glad you've came as you are. But many places across the world stop there. And they, and they don't require repentance as God does. They don't require a change in life as God does. So we fought this battle for a long time, especially in more recent years. But here's what the devil wants us to do. The devil wants us to show partiality. The devil wants us to look at one person's sins as worse than someone else's sins. And that's a problem. The church at Corinth had plenty of people within their midst that struggled with that exact same sin. But they repented. They changed. They converted to Christ and they left that old life behind. And so, you know, I, I don't think we can just say, you're not welcome here because of that particular sin that you struggle with. But I fear that there are plenty of folks who, who would uphold or uplift that sin more than something else and not be welcoming, not be open, and not see that person as a, as a, as a chance to, to bring them to Christ. James says a whole lot about partiality. He, he, he gives this entire example, and we're all very familiar with it, about somebody who comes in who's rich, and we give him the seat of honor. Somebody who comes in and who's poor, we make him sit at the footstool. And, and at the end of the whole thing in James chapter 2, he says, For judgment is without mercy to the one who shows no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And when I look at somebody who struggles with whether they know they're struggling with it or not, the sin of homosexuality. Where is my mercy? It needs to be there. I need to have mercy on those who, even though I, I view their sin as something that I would never even struggle with myself, can I have empathy for them? Can I, can I reach out to them? Even if they don't want me to reach out to them, can I still open that door? Let's understand that that Jesus Christ died for all sins, not just the ones that we view are important enough to die for. So let's find a balance. Let's not, ha let's not have spent so much time fighting this battle that we forget to acknowledge God's power to forgive all sins. Let's make sure that we acknowledge the powerful truth that God gave his son to die for us all, and that we should never close our hearts to certain categories of people. So we fought that battle. We've also fought the battle of women's role in the church. I mean, we're just rapid firing through these, right? There's a lot. I preached this lesson one time, and there were, there were 12 points. We're only dealing with five. So that was a very long lesson. Um, women's roles in the church. That's a battle that we've fought, and I think it's an important battle. I think we have plenty of examples in God's word about when, when women are permitted to do certain things and when they're not permitted to do certain things. And if you look at the Bible and you say, well, that's just that old fashioned, outdated and, and just antiquated because women are being subjugated to a certain role and men are being put into another position, fine. If you want to view the Bible that way, then fine. But that's what it says. And I believe what it says. And I'm willing to follow what it says. But the churches across the nation have decided to throw out that, that requirement about women's role and, and, and the, where they should serve and where they should not serve, putting them in a position of, of evangelists, elders, all sorts of things that, that would be technically permit, or not permitted within the context of what we read about in the New Testament. And again, if, if you've never read through some of these passages and you'd like to study these things more, we'd love to study with you. 
But here's the danger. We may have fought this battle for so long that we forget that women are valuable, especially in our worship, especially in the church. Women are valued. They can be effective in our work as the church, collectively. Without women in, in this congregation doing their part, how would we ever be able to, to bear all the kind of wonderful fruit that God wants us to bear? What if this congregation was all men? No. We, yeah, see? Even the, even, the, even the baby knows. If the congregation was all men, if the body of Christ was all men, we would be in big trouble. You, there would be, we'd be having some real tough, tough times with hospitality, with, with encouragement, with mercy. I believe very strongly that some of, some of the most genuinely loving people of, of many groups around the country are the women. And they help us men understand how to be that way too. We're not naturally like that, some of us, most of us. But what a great blessing it is that in song throughout our worship service that we have the soprano and alto section. In, in our Bible classes, that we have those who are able to teach the young ones. And, and, you know, just because we don't have an opportunity, just because you as women may not have an opportunity to get up here and speak, to serve in some public capacity, I think we've elevated public service, public worship, to some level that it just should not be elevated to. We as the church are more than just standing up here speaking. We're, we as the church are more than just offering public prayer or leading singing. We as the church are an entire body. All of us are effective and useful for God's service, no matter what your gender is. And so let's be careful that we haven't emphasized the role of men so much and the, and the lack of ability for women to do certain things to the point where we've forgotten the great things that women can do. Titus chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, older women that they be reverent in behavior, sland not slanders, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands and to love their children. The roles of women to, to help be an encouragement to those who are younger than them. We see Proverbs 31 about the virtuous woman and all the things that a woman can be in the, in the sight of God. So let's not view the body of Christ as simply being comprised of men. Let's acknowledge the great value of women in our group as well and find that balance. Are you looking as a woman, are you looking for opportunities to serve? Or are you just simply discouraged by all the things that you can't do? So let's make sure that we haven't allowed this battle about women's role in the church to, to, to steer us away from what God really wants us to do, to be an entire united body of Christ. All right, and then the last one. The social gospel. This is a big one. And we fought this battle a lot, right? We fought this battle quite a lot about those who would make fun and entertainment and sports activities and all kinds of other amazing, wonderful, lavish events the focus of what the church is about. And it's, it's enticing, right? I mean, really, if you think about it, like st sitting here for 30 minutes listening to me is a lot less exciting than jumping in a bounce house. <coughs> it is. I mean, I'll be I'll straight up, be honest with you. But the draw of the word of Christ, the draw of the church, is more than entertainment, is more than these things. And we fought this battle for years and years and years. Here's the danger. And, and I'll say this, I don't believe we struggle with this danger as much, but maybe we could if not, if not careful. The devil wants us to be cold. He wants us to swing the pendulum the other way. And we want to be so much different, like the, different than the denominations that we, we don't want to have anything to do with each other, being cold, uninvolved, disconnected from each other, no fellowship. We'll be here on Sunday. We'll leave as soon as the, the, the bell rings and we'll go home. We, we ignore 
Hebrews telling us to admonish one another and, and be an encouragement for one another when we're assembled together. But I think that goes so far outside of just the, the public worship. Fellowship with one another, encouragement of one another. Acts chapter 2 and the example of the early church, what do we see there that they were doing day by day, being with one another, encouraging one another? And you might find an excuse and a half every single second for why you can't do that. But we need to be an encouragement for each other daily. Being connected with each other, in each other's homes, in each other's lives, so that we don't fall away from the love of Christ, so that we don't fall away from the truth. We need to be exhorting one another. And I believe that in generations gone by, this point is probably one of the greatest points that have caused a lot of young people to leave the church. Because we fought so hard against the social gospel that we forgot that we should be friendly with each other and connected with each other. And you know, when I have more friends outside of the church than in the church, you know where I wanna go? I wanna go outside the church. Friendship with each other, connection with each other, spending time with each other, being involved in each other's lives is absolutely authorized within God's word, especially in the example of the early church. And so let's make sure that we haven't allowed the pendulum fighting against the social gospel to go so far the other direction that we say, oh, all right, see you guys at uh, 11.45, I'm out. And I'll see you maybe, maybe Wednesday. Let's make sure we're connected with each other. Let's make sure we find that balance. And, and, and let's let our joy in this world show to the point where people can see us and our connection and our friendship and our love for one another, and they can see the love of Christ reflected right from that. They can see what the church is really about. That it's not cold, it's not stoic, it's not dead. It's the problem that Ephesus had though, right? They fought and they fought and they fought but they forgot to love. They forgot to be connected to the Lord and, and to his son. Let's be zealous. Let's be shining. Let's be vibrant. Let's be on fire. Let's be in each other's lives. And so these are just a few of the battles that we've faced. Lots of hard fought battles and all very important. But have we allowed these battles to help us lose focus, to cause us to lose focus on what's most important? It's absolutely something that we need to be doing, but the danger is spending so much time in this battle that we miss out on what's most important. So find the balance. Don't just strive to, to be unlike the denominations. Don't just strive to, to, to not do what the false teaching in the world is out there trying to teach us to do. Let's strive to be the kind of people that God wants us to be, the kind of church that God wants us to be, the kind of church that he sent his son to die for. Take out your songbooks, turn to the number that's been announced. It's not a lesson that would teach anybody what to do to be saved, quite honestly. However, baptism is available to you, and I don't want to focus only on baptism. If you have studied the word of God and you understand what it is that you need to do to be saved, you are pricked in the heart, you, 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 you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he did die for your sins and for my sins. If you believe that and you are ready to change your life, if you're ready to look the other direction and say, that life is behind me, a new life is ahead of me and I'm going to become a new creature. If you have understood that and you're ready to confess his name before men now and for the rest of your life, then we're ready to baptize you. And if you're here and you're somebody who needs the prayers of this congregation for help in some way, uh, we'd love to pray for you. We'd love to help you in whatever ways we can. Please come as we stand and sing.